This movie contains disturbing footage which may be too intense for some viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. Situated in the eastern side of the Ural Mountains, the city of Sverdlovsk was one of the many closed cities that existed in Soviet Union from late 1940s until its dissolution in 1991. It was known for the famous Golden Dome Church on Blood, built in the early 21st century. The monument to the founders still stands by the banks of the Iset River. During the time of World War II, Sverdlovsk was used to be the headquarters of the Ural Military District and since then this city had been a major production center of Soviet military industrial complex. It was the April 2nd of 1979. An unusual outbreak of anthrax shook the entire civilian population of Sverdlovsk. It started by infecting the workers of a local ceramic plant and almost all of them died within a week. It gradually started spreading among the localities infecting the people. According to the official record, the disease claimed almost 100 lives, but the actual number is still unknown. Officials came 1,000 miles from Moscow to investigate into this matter. Their report concluded that the disease spread due to the consumption of contaminated meat. The deaths were caused by the infection of intestinal anthrax which is generally found in cattle. This became the official statement of Soviet authorities regarding this incident. But surprisingly KGB covered up all the evidences related to this disaster and the hospital records of all the victims were entirely destroyed. It was the time of Cold War. So the US publicly made suspicion that there had to be another side of that story. But the Soviets denied every plausible suspicion and tried to prove their contaminated meat story at numerous international conferences. It wasn't until the dissolution of Soviet Union in 1991, when Boris Yeltsin, the first president of Russian Federation and a former Communist Party official of Sverdlovsk, finally admitted that the anthrax outbreak was actually the result of a military activity at the facility. After this statement, Russia allowed a team of Western scientists to go to Sverdlovsk to investigate the outbreak. The team visited Sverdlovsk in June 1992 and August 1993 headed by Professor Matt Meselson. The Western scientists were able to track where all the victims had been at the time of the anthrax release. Their investigation found that the outbreak of the disease was due to the leak of an aerosol of anthrax pathogens from a secret bioweapon research facility at Sverdlovsk. Their findings uncovered Soviets' controversial biological warfare program during the time of Cold War. The strain that spread was anthrax 836, the most powerful in Soviet arsenal. This strain was planned to be used as warheads for the SS-18 Intercontinental Ballistic Missile, which would target American cities. After the 1979 incident, the Soviet government put a huge effort to cover up the hazard because it directly violated the International Biological Weapons Convention of 1975. This accident is sometimes referred to as Biological Chernobyl. The biological weapon facility in Sverdlovsk was built after World War II, based on the documentation captured from some secret facilities of the Imperial Japanese Army during the war in Manchuria. The facilities, hidden from the outside world, were used to carry out one of the most brutal and inhuman military programs in the history of mankind. Unit 731. The witness of the most notorious war crimes carried out by Imperial Japan. A chapter, soaked with the tears and bloods of millions of innocents, buried deep inside the forgotten pages of history. A sin that can never be pardoned.
It was the December of 1949. Four years have been passed since America waged the first nuclear attack in human history. The world was still fighting with the devastations of World War II. The fascist powers had been successfully taken down by the Allied forces, peace had been established. Two extensive military tribunals were held under international law and laws of war to bring the war criminals to justice. Most of the evicted Nazi officials had been sentenced to death in the Nuremberg trials. The 11 judges panel of the Tokyo Tribunal had submitted its verdict just a year ago. Seven out of the 23 evicted Japanese officials were sentenced to death, for the charges of war crimes, crimes against humanity, and crimes against peace. Although the Emperor Hirohito and other members of the Japanese imperial family were argued not to be tried by the authorities of the United States. The world believed that at last justice had been served by the Allied power for those millions of innocents bombed, shot, slaughtered, raped in the deadliest conflict of human history. But the truth was something different. The city of Khabarovsk, one of the largest cities within the Russian Far East. It sets on the Amur River that runs along the Russia-China border and was for many years the far eastern capital of Russia. But the city is known in history for the famous Khabarovsk war crime trial. Twelve officials of the Japanese Kwantung Army, captured by the Soviet Union during its invasion in Manchuria, were held here to be prosecuted. Pursuing illegal bio-warfare programs and using bioweapons on Chinese military and civilians during the Second Sino-Japanese War, had been a strong widely spoken acquisition against Japan since the commencement of World War II. During the Tokyo trial, the Chinese prosecution instigated one reference to Japanese experiments with poisonous serums on Chinese civilians, but the claim was dismissed by the tribunal president for lack of evidence. Despite being completely silent about this issue in Tokyo, the Soviets finally decided to separately hold a tribunal. This was the only time war criminals were ever been tried for creating a biological weapon. The 12 defendants included General Yamada Otozu, the commander-in-chief of Kwantung Army, Ryuji Kojitsuka, chief of medical administration, Takamatsu Takahashi, chief of veterinary service, and nine other Japanese officials. The defendants were questioned, their testimonies were recorded, and what the jurisdiction found stupefied the entire world. That was for the first time the vicious stories of Unit 731 officially came to the surface. It was a covert biological and chemical warfare research and development unit of the Imperial Japanese Army that undertook lethal human experimentation during the Second World War. Everyone knows about the atrocities of Nazi concentration camps, everyone talks about that. But the gruesomeness and horrors of the inhuman experiments carried out inside the camps of Unit 731 were not at any part less than that. All these started in Japan 17 years ago, back in 1932. For a period of 214 years, Japan had kept itself isolated from the outside world. It wasn't until 1854 when Commodore Matthew Perry and the black ships of the United States Navy forced Japan to sign the Convention of Kanagawa, which opened the Japanese ports for the Americans to trade. Subsequent similar treaties with other Western countries brought economic and political crises to Japan and led the existing feudal military government to collapse. This sudden power vacancy brought a political shift to extreme right-wing ideologies or statism. The nationalists started raising in power. During the Meiji era, the Empire of Japan emerged as the most developed and industrialized world power in Asia and started pursuing military conflict to expand its sphere of influence. World War I allowed Japan to join the side of the victorious allies. In the meantime, Japan fought two wars with China and Russia and subsequently occupied the regions of Taiwan and Korea. In 1931 the Kwantung Army of the Empire of Japan invaded Manchuria.
The war lasted for one year. In February 1932, Japan occupied Manchuria and subsequently established its puppet state Manchukuo. Army Minister Sadao Araki played a very important role in the nationalist right-wing politics of Japan. For a very long time, he was an active supporter of the Northern Expansion Doctrine, which proposed attack and occupation of the Soviet Far East and Siberia. The occupation of Manchuria was the essential first step of his plan. Araki knew, invading Stalin's Russia won't be easy until Japan had something very strong and unique in its arsenal. By 1900 the germ theory and advances in bacteriology brought a new level of sophistication to the techniques for the possible use of bioagents in war. The German Empire undertook biological sabotage during World War I. Araki decided to take it to a next level. Though the 1925 Geneva Protocol prohibited the use of biological and chemical weapons, he thought to take it as an opportunity. In 1932, Araki appointed his favorite surgeon major, Shiro Ishii, in the command of the Army Epidemic Prevention Research Laboratory or AEPRL. Ishii had started his career in the Imperial Japanese Army as a military surgeon. Soon his work impressed his superiors and he was promoted to Surgeon Captain and Surgeon Major subsequently. In 1928, his research on the effects of biological and chemical warfare developments from World War I helped to win him the patronage of Sadao Araki. For a long time, Ishii was advocating for the creation of a Japanese bioweapons program on the grounds that Western powers were developing their own. Getting appointed as the commander of AEPRL and having the support of the Army Minister and other senior officials of the Imperial Army opened up a golden opportunity for him. Ishii organized a secret research group called the Togo Unit and started experimenting on biological and chemical weapons. Preliminary experiments were performed on lab animals. Encouraged by the results, he sought to replicate these outcomes with human trials. But due to containment issues and ethical constraints, conducting human experimentation was impossible in Tokyo. But in 1932 occupation of Manchuria provided a conducive environment for Ishii's research. It had mainly two reasons. First, Manchuria was close to USSR, so launching attacks from there would be easier. Second, there was a huge population of non-Japanese people in Manchuria. So there is an ample supply of human test subjects as they could be plucked from the streets like rats. Situated 100 kilometers south of Harbin on South Manchuria Railway, Beiyanhe was a diffuse village of about 300 homes known to the local people as Zhang Ma City. The Imperial Japanese Army burnt down the entire village into ashes. Ishii found this place perfect to set up his secret bio-warfare research facility and perform human experimentation. A nearby large construction was selected as the headquarter. This was named the Zongoma Fortress. The facility was hugely secured with three-meter-high earthen walls topped with electrified barbed wire and a moat with drawbridge surrounded the buildings within. There were hundreds of rooms and smaller surrounding laboratories, office buildings, barracks, and dining facilities, warehouses and munition storage, power station, crematoria, and the prison cells. The facility was sufficient in itself. The Japanese Imperial Army conscripted local Chinese labor for the construction. Due to secrecy, laborers were escorted by armed guards and forced to wear blinders. Those who worked on the most sensitive areas of the prison camp were executed once construction was complete. 
The facility was estimated to have held 500 to 600 prisoners at a time to be used as test subjects. They included common criminals, captured bandits, anti-Japanese partisans, political prisoners, suspects, mentally retarded people, even innocent local civilians. But in August of 1934, 16 prisoners somehow managed to escape from Jongma. They spread the word of the crimes against humanity being conducted by Shiro and his subordinates inside the prison camps. This unexpected exposure compelled the authorities to close down the Jongma fort. But Shiro didn't stop there. He transferred the activities to a new site 24 kilometers south of Harbin called Pingfong and continued to pursue his experiments. New facilities had been built there, new prisoners had been brought and the new site came to be known as Unit 731. In the meantime, significant changes took place in world politics. Adolf Hitler and his Nazi party had raised to the power of Germany. The Soviet Union was becoming a world superpower under the leadership of Stalin. In 1936 the Empire of Japan signed the Anti-Comintern Pact with Nazi Germany, directed against the Communist International. In the same year, Emperor Hirohito authorized the expansion of Unit 731 and its integration into the Kwantung Army in the name of the Epidemic Prevention and Water Purification Department of the Kwantung Army. In addition to that, another biological warfare facility named Unit 100, and a chemical warfare facility named Unit 516 were also established in Manchuria. More than 300 researchers and bacteriologists were recruited in those facilities. Besides that, Ishii's network got strong financial support from the army. A special project code named Maruta used human beings as test subjects for experiments. A variety of medical experiments were conducted on the prisoners within the camp. The subjects were forcefully injected with disease disguised as vaccination to study their effect on the human body. They contaminated foods and other livestock of the prisoners with deadly germs. Even children were given chocolates tainted with lethal microbes. The victims were tested, different treatment processes were performed on them. Most of the people died due to these fatal diseases. Those who survived were injected and tested again until they die. These human test subjects were referred to as logs by the Japanese, used in such context as how many logs fell or how many subjects died. Thousands of men, women, children were subjected to vivisection, even without anesthesia inside those labs. Vivisections were performed on prisoners after infecting them with diseases. They performed invasive surgery, removing organs to study the effect of those diseases on the human body. Prisoners' limbs were amputated in order to study blood loss. Sometimes some sadistic experiments were performed just out of curiosity. Like the amputated limbs were reattached on the opposite side of the body. Some prisoners had their stomachs surgically removed and the esophagus reattached to the intestines. Parts of organs, such as the brain, lungs, and liver, were removed from some prisoners. The average life expectancy of a prisoner inside those camps was only one month. A post-war confession of Japanese army surgeon Ken Yuasa suggested that the practice of vivisection on human subjects was widespread even outside Unit 731. At least 1,000 Japanese personnel were involved in such practices in mainland China. In 1937, World War II started in Asia. Followed by an invasion of China, a deadly military conflict waged between China and the Empire of Japan known as the Second Sino-Japanese War. The war made up the Chinese theater of the wider Pacific theater of the Second World War. Besides that, this provided Ishii a suitable ground to test the bioweapons devised in Unit 731. 
During the war, more biological and chemical warfare units were established in major cities of Japan-occupied China. This included Unit 1855 in Beijing, Unit 1644 in Nanjing, Unit 8604 in Guangzhou, and Unit 9420 in Singapore. All these units along with Unit 731 were involved in the development and experimental deployment of epidemic creating bio-warfare weapons against both the Chinese civilians and military. Throughout 1940 to 1941, the Kwantung Army executed several biological attacks on Chinese cities. Plague-infected fleas were spread by low-flying airplanes upon coastal Ningbo and Changde and Hunan province. This military aerial spraying killed tens of thousands of people with bubonic plague epidemics. An expedition to Nanking involved spreading typhoid and paratyphoid germs into livestock. Snacks infused with pathogens were distributed among the locals. Epidemics broke out shortly after, killing millions of people. An attack on Changde in 1941 led to approximately 10,000 biological casualties. At least 12 large-scale field trials of biological weapons were performed, and at least 11 Chinese cities were attacked with biological agents. In the meantime, World War II had started with Hitler's invasion of Poland. Germany, Italy, and Japan had signed the Tripartite Pact officially forming the Axis power. Hitler had ordered the invasion of the Soviet Union, codenamed Operation Barbarossa, deliberately breaking the non-aggression pact between them. The attack of the Japanese Navy Air Service on the naval base at Pearl Harbor, at last, had brought the United States into the war. The Japanese army had achieved significant progression inside mainland China. Now invading the Soviet Union was their primary objective. But at that time, the extremely cold environment of Siberia was a big problem for the soldiers to fight in Russia. That was one of the many reasons why the Nazi army had failed to conquer Moscow. So Ishii was ordered to devise a method in order to prevent frostbite in extremely cold weather. Army engineer Hisato Yoshimura was in charge of this testing. He conducted experiments by taking the prisoners outside, dipping their limbs into the water of varying temperatures, and allowing that to freeze. Once frozen, he would strike their affected limbs with a short stick, emitting a sound resembling that which a board gives when it is struck. Ice was then chipped away, with the affected area being subjected to various treatments such as being doused in water, exposed to the heat of fire which failed most of the times. In the name of testing the response of the human body in different environmental conditions, they performed several other experiments which are psychopathically sadistic, with no conceivable practical application. Subjects were deprived of food and water to determine the length of time until death, placed into low-pressure chambers until their eyes popped from the sockets, placed into centrifuges and spun until death, injected with animal blood, exposed to lethal doses of X-rays, subjected to various chemical weapons inside gas chambers, injected with seawater, even burned or buried alive. In the Khabarovsk war crimes trial, Sergeant Major Satoru Kurakazu testified against Yoshimura describing his experience about the frostbite experiment. When I walked into the prison laboratory, five Chinese test subjects were sitting on a bench. Two of these Chinese had no fingers at all, their hands were black, in those of three others, the bones were visible. They had fingers, but they were only bones. Yoshimura told me that this was the result of freezing experiments. Human targets were also used to test the severity of different weapons. In the Khabarovsk trial, Kawashima Kiyoshi, one of Ishii's close officials, testified that they were used to tie up 10 to 15 persons separately with stacks, and blust grenades and flamethrowers near them to test how these explosives hurt victims. Pathogen-releasing bombs, chemical weapons, as well as bayonets, and knives were also tested in the same way. Experiments related to different sexually transmitted diseases, especially syphilis were also carried out on those prisoners. In most cases, women fell victim to these tests. 
they were raped by camp guards to make them pregnant. The hypothetical possibility of vertical transmission of diseases, from mother to child, particularly syphilis, was the stated reason for those tortures. Pregnant women were vivisected alive and fetuses were taken out to observe the effect of disease on different stages of the fetus. The testimony of a unit member that served as a guard graphically demonstrated this reality. One of the former researchers I located told me that one day he had a human experiment scheduled, but there was still time to kill. So he and another unit member took the keys to the cells and opened one that housed a Chinese woman. One of the unit members raped her. The other member took the keys and opened another cell. There was a Chinese woman in there who had been used in a frostbite experiment. She had several fingers missing and her bones were black, with gangrene set in. He was about to rape her anyway, then he saw that her sex organ was festering, with pus oozing to the surface. He gave up the idea, left and locked the door, then later went on to his experimental work. They also orchestrated forced sex acts between infected and non-infected prisoners to transmit the disease. The testimony of a prison guard shows. Infection of venereal disease by injection was abandoned, and the researchers started forcing the prisoners into sexual acts with each other. Four or five unit members, dressed in white laboratory clothing completely covering the body with only eyes and mouth visible, rest covered, handled the tests. A male and female, one infected with syphilis, would be brought together in a cell and forced into sex with each other. It was made clear that anyone resisting would be shot. It was the February of 1944. The Allied forces had been getting significant success in Europe. Germany and Italy were almost knocked down. In Yalta Conference, the Allies had agreed on the occupation of post-war Germany and Russia had decided to wage war against Japan. Chinese army, with the help of the Soviets and America, was becoming heavy on the Japanese troops in Manchuria. Japan was on the descending side of the balance of power. They became too desperate to do something big. By the time, far from Tokyo, inside the four walls of Unit 731, something very very massive was getting planned. The operation, developed by Shiro Ishii was codenamed Operation Cherry Blossoms at Night. The plan was to wage biological warfare upon the civilian population in Southern California of the United States. Five of the new I-400 long-range submarines were to be sent across the Pacific Ocean, each carrying three IGM-6A Siren aircraft loaded with plague-infected fleas. The submarines would surface and launch the aircraft towards the target. The aircraft will subsequently drop the fleas via balloon bombs or crash in enemy territory. Either way, the plague would infect and kill thousands of people in that area. The severity of that attack was not any less than a nuclear explosion. The plan was scheduled to begin on September 22, 1945. There can be no peace in the world until the military power of Japan is destroyed. With the same completeness as was the power of the European dictators. To do that, we are now engaged in a process of deploying millions of our armed forces against Japan in a mass movement of troops and supplies and weapons over 14,000 miles. A military and naval feat unequaled in all history. We have no desire or intention to destroy or enslave the Japanese people. But only surrender can prevent the kind of ruin which they have seen come to Germany as a result of continued useless resistance. But on the 26th of July, the Allied forces called for the unconditional surrender of the Japanese armed forces. In response, Japan publicly stated its intent to fight on to the bitter end. As a result on August 6th, at 8.15 a.m. of local time, the United States detonated Little Boy.
joy over the Japanese city of Hiroshima. Two days later in the late evening of the 8th of August, the Red Army invaded Manchuria, directly violating the Soviet-Japanese neutrality pact. Hours later another atomic bomb was dropped on the Japanese city of Nagasaki. At 12 o'clock noon on August 15, the Emperor of Japan recorded a speech to the nation, reading the imperial rescript on Japan's unconditional surrender and the termination of the war. General Douglas MacArthur came to Tokyo as the supreme commander of Allied powers to sign the instrument of surrender. The formal surrender occurred on September 2, 1945, in Tokyo Bay aboard USS Missouri. We are gathered here, representatives of the major warring powers, to conclude a solemn agreement whereby peace may be restored. Japanese Foreign Minister Shigemitsu signed for the Japanese government, while General Umazu signed for the Japanese armed forces. In the meantime, with the rapid progression of the Red Army inside Manchuria, Ishii and his unit members had to abandon their works in haste. Ministries in Tokyo had already ordered the destruction of all incriminating materials, including those in Pingfong. All the potential witnesses such as the 300 remaining prisoners were either gassed or fed poison while the 600 Chinese and Manchurian laborers were shot. Ishii ordered every member of the Togo unit to disappear and take the secret to the grave. Nishi Toshihide, who was the head of training in Unit 731, remembered in his trial. All the personnel was issued potassium cyanide vials. Almost 120 personnel committed suicide inside the unit. Skeleton crews of Ishii's Japanese troops blew up the entire compound to destroy evidence of their activities but many were sturdy enough to remain somewhat intact. Ishii was arrested by the United States Authority during the occupation of Japan after its surrender. He and his other leaders were supposed to be thoroughly interrogated by Soviet authorities. After the arrest, Lt. Col. Murray Sanders of U.S. Armed Forces arrived in Yokohama to investigate Japanese biological warfare activity. At the time of his arrival in Japan, he had no knowledge of what Unit 731 was. Until Sanders finally threatened the Japanese with bringing the Soviets into the picture, little information about biological warfare was being shared with the Americans. The Japanese wanted to avoid prosecution under the Soviet legal system, so the next morning after he made his threat, Sanders received a manuscript describing Japan's involvement in biological warfare. Sanders took this information to General Douglas MacArthur. MacArthur struck a deal with Japanese informants. He secretly granted immunity to the physicians of Unit 731, including their leader Shiro Ishii, in exchange for providing America, but not the other wartime allies, with their research on biological warfare, and data from human experimentation. MacArthur believed that the research data was extremely valuable, and did not want other nations, particularly the Soviet Union, to get his hand on that. Ishii managed to avoid his prosecution in Tokyo trial with the help of U.S. authorities and was never prosecuted for any war crimes later. His exact whereabouts were unknown from 1947. Soviet during its invasion of Manchuria had achieved to gather significant evidence regarding the Japanese bio-warfare program and Unit 731. Numerous members of the former Kwantung Army had been captured by the Red Soldiers. Soviet tried them all in the Khabarovsk trial. The lead prosecutor was Lev Smirnov, who had been one of the top Soviet prosecutors at the Nuremberg trials. The proprietors received sentences ranging from 2 to 25 years in a Siberian labor camp. Although the sentences were unusually lenient by Soviet standards, and all but one of the defendants returned to Japan by the 1950s while the remaining prisoners committed suicide inside the cell. The United States refused to acknowledge the trials, branding them as communist propaganda. 
The U.S. also asserted that the trials were to only serve as a distraction from the Soviet treatment of several hundred thousand Japanese prisoners of war. It is believed that the Japanese had also given information to the Soviets regarding their biological experimentation for judicial leniency. This was evidenced by the Sverdlovsk incident where the Soviet Union was secretly building a biological weapons facility using documentation captured from Unit 731 in Manchuria. Ishii died on 9 October 1959 from laryngeal cancer at the age of 67. In his last years, Ishii could not speak clearly, he was on pain medication and spoke in a harsh voice. According to his daughter, he converted to Catholicism shortly before his death. There was consensus among U.S. researchers in the post-war period that the human experimentation data gained from the Japanese was of little value to the development of American biological weapons and medicine. Post-war reports have generally regarded the data as crude and ineffective, with one expert even deeming it amateurish. U.S. scientists generally wanted to acquire it was due to the concept of forbidden fruit, believing that lawful and ethical prohibitions could affect the outcomes of their research. Unit 731 presents a special problem. Since unlike Nazi human experimentation, the activities of Unit 731 are known to the general public only from the testimonies of willing former unit members, and testimony cannot be employed to determine indemnity in this way. Japanese history textbooks usually contain references to Unit 731, but do not go into detail about allegations. In October 2003, Prime Minister Junichiro Koizumi made a statement that the Japanese government did not possess any records related to Unit 731, but the government recognizes the gravity of the matter and will publicize any records that were located in the future. In April 2018, the National Archives of Japan released the names of 3,607 members of Unit 731. But Japan still denies what happened in Unit 731, explaining that many accounts are over-exaggerated or did not take place at all. Until this day many families of the victims still demand justice.